Welcome to the Common Good Podcast, a conversation about the significance of place, eliminating economic isolation, and the structure of belonging. My name is Joey Taylor, and I'm the producer of the podcast. For this episode, I speak with multidisciplinary artist and teacher, Julia Orcara Bianco. Julia was born in Argentina and now lives in Cincinnati, and much of her work focuses on the neighborhoods of Evanston, Clifton, in a particular park called Burnett Woods. Julia has a new book called Habitats, which follows the thread that connects individuals, community, and environment. In this conversation, we talk about invitation, belonging to a particular place, collective memory, and the experience of migration. Julia begins by describing what she means when she uses the word community. A community is something that is there already and there are different communities the community of Burnett Woods for example and this is very specific to place I understand that community not only as a community of humans I also understand Burnett Woods as an ecological community I belong to that community but I also have this I don't want to say freedom but this different movement. I'm there, I'm not there, I go in and out. Now talking about community making or community building, specifically with my work, there's an intention to create opportunities and invitations for people to be intentional about how they want to exist with others. This sounds abstract, but it actually isn't. When I created a series of meetings called Walking the Winter, My intention was to create these opportunities and these offerings so that whoever wants and needs it shows up. And I was very intentional about the area. So it was Clifton and Burnett Woods. Everything happened within three blocks of radius so that people living in those in those neighborhoods had easy access. And if anybody else wanted to come from far away, that was fine. Now, the intention was a little more expansive than acknowledging Burnett Woods as an important site for our city, which absolutely is. And I think it's important for us to protect those green spaces as urbanites. But the intention was to bring people together and see what happened, really see what happened. I don't think that a community is kind of like clear cut, all pretty, and everyone agrees and everyone is the same. I think that a thriving community is a community that is comprised of people that are different and that will sometimes disagree and that will disagree gracefully and that will celebrate difference. Understanding that in essence, we can all be humans, but our backgrounds, uh, our histories, our privilege is different. And how do we embrace that? And how do we look at each other with soft eyes, right? We, we spend a lot of time thinking about how you invite people into community. I think maybe you have a particular vantage point on this. So through the immigrant experience, I would assume that there would need to be some type of invitation from the place that you're landing in before you begin to do the work of creating community. Maybe I'm wrong about that, though. So could, could you talk about what does it look like for you to be invited into places that you find yourself landing? And then at what point do you transition into inviting others into the spaces that you're creating? I will say as an immigrant, I have not always been invited to places. This idea of just like arriving and really having to make a space for me there Sometimes it doesn't look like an invitation. It just looks like, listen, I come here because where I come from is like really bad and I have a lot to offer. So I think there are different ways of of migrating to places. Now, having said that and having gone through that, and this is something that is still not prevalent, but still happens. And I think this happens in different ways for different people. If we think about race or class, sometimes we really have to work to make space for ourselves in an environment. 
But from my experience of migration, I can acknowledge that sometimes we are not welcome. And that doesn't mean that we don't deserve to be there. And that doesn't mean that we don't deserve to be seen and nourished because what are borders, right? <laughs> so there's a lot of inner work that I had to go through to be able to create an invitation for others. But the reason why I create an invitation for others is because I may have not had that most of the time. It's the same with my teaching practice. When I think about my teaching practice, I think about what are the opportunities that I did not have that I would have liked, that I feel I would have thrived on. Because there are struggles that are necessary in life. And there are other struggles that you don't need to go through. So how do we nourish that generation? How do we nourish others in the spirit of generosity? Because that's change. When I was listening to you and reading your stuff, the way I imagined you arriving in a place, because it seems like you're so in tune with particular locations, like I, I almost imagine a particular plant or piece of ground calling to you in some meaningful way and being like, you're, you're welcome here or you're here now. And that would give you permission to then do the work and provide the gifts that you have so abundantly. Is that at all resonant for you and how you imagine? I would say yes, especially with plants. And it's a practice. Listening to the plants is like what some people say, like reading the room. And sometimes it's like reading the situation or like reading the space and being able to humbly listen, which I admit I'm still not too good at. But the more you practice it, the better you become. So in the experience of migration at the beginning, there can be a lot of struggle and misunderstandings and frustration because speaking about my experience, I was not being humble to understand that I needed to listen. That's why I talk a lot about we have to learn to listen better. But again, the more you practice, the better you become at it at some point, especially with plants and now being a, a gardener of sorts through observation and being there. I can recognize when this is an invitation and when this is a no, like harvesting, for example. And there's this author, Robin Wall Kimmer, who talks a lot about that. Ask for permission, listen to the answer. You talk a lot about collective memory. So I, maybe this is a good kind of pivot point here. When you have nostalgia or like homesickness for a place, what place first comes to mind for you? Can you like paint that picture for us? Wow, that's a great question. I miss home and I understand that nostalgia is this romanticized version of reality. But thinking about home, and it's weird to call it home because it's not home, hasn't been for 10 years now, but... When I think about Buenos Aires, it feels so strange and so warm, but very strange. So Buenos Aires is a city that you either walk or take the bus. There are a lot of cars, but very few people have cars. So this can sound a little contradictory, but it's true. There are tons of buses. Generally speaking, though, once you land somewhere, you're just going to be walking around. Uh, the city is very walkable. Uh, as far as I remember, it's very, very pretty. The architecture is neoclassical European. There are many parks in the city, although it's so densely populated. So I feel like what I miss or what gives me nostalgia about Buenos Aires is when I remember walking around the streets. And this is also tied into place, right? Just little walks that you schedule for yourself when you live in a city that you walk around a lot. So going to all the bookstores that are like on a specific avenue close to downtown, just spending time there browsing around, with like just looking at old books, the little cafes and the smell of the of the city and the messiness, messiness of it and the beauty of it, how loud it is. It's so loud and it's so alive. In that sense, I do miss the city, but it's that specific city. It's not any other city. Buenos Aires is like, I, I don't think there's there's a way to compare it, but people are very warm. They're very helpful. They're very loud too, as I said. Maybe because we come from 
Italians mostly, <laughs> so <laughs> which is like yelling at each other in a good way and just laughing very loud. The pastries are amazing. There's a lot of wandering, and it's also a very experiential, very embodied practice. At this point, I ask Julia to share a poem from her new book, Habitats. As she shares, you're invited to take a breath, settle in, and listen. This poem is called Shared Breath. I came out wondering, asking the trees and the singing birds for words to help me understand what it means to be present with others. Water fell from the gray sky in drops sometimes thick and abundant, sometimes slim and sharp, sometimes tiny and gentle. Birds sang next to each other, asking and answering to their correspondence inquiries as a whole. All different songs, overall a complex melody that I fail to understand, but that for me lends into a harmony of mystery that hides the clues to my predicament. We feel alone in a world full of others. Our souls touch even when our hands and feet remain distant. The forest is like a family where everyone is essential in its own uniqueness and individuality. There is nothing I have to do except to embrace this generosity. One thing I can offer is the presence of a shared breath for me to extend myself, for others to expand, for us to grow together. Now we return to the conversation. So I think one of the shortcuts to creating community with folks is having a a shared collective memory. And when you show up to a place new, almost by definition, you don't have that with folks. So talk a little bit about how you think about a collective memory and how you can leverage that or create a new memory like how does that work when you are trying to cultivate community anew and i and i've been thinking about that question a lot actually to me the listening again comes in as very necessary and using the winter series as an example this was a three month long program it happened every saturday rain or shine in the clifton area i wasn't facilitating every session but i facilitated at least half of those so i was exposing myself to folks that i did not know i did not know who was going to show up uh, and i got to meet a, a, a lot of people that way I think when I thought about that series, again, using it as an example, I thought about mutual support and community building in a season that is very challenging emotionally for people, but for me as well. And when I reflect on it, I came to acknowledge that I did the series also to be able to connect to others and to listen to their stories and to listen to the specificity of their stories. And that blew me away. Honestly, people were neighbors. They were talking about things and other neighbors that had been in the area for a long time. So I think I was the one who learned the most out of it. And of course, every information, everything that I learned from them, I am looking at that from my own perspective, which is I'm not from here. And it's so interesting to me to think about even here in my neighborhood, I live in Evanston. It's so interesting to me to think about my neighbors having lived in this neighborhood for generations. Or when I meet fellow artists or just friends and realize that they have gone to high school together something that I am so removed from that I find it almost like science fiction. Now, from my own perspective, I can only process it from the place of a foreigner in a way. I think I've come to a place where I am acknowledging and being okay with the fact that I am not from here. That doesn't mean that I don't belong here. It just means that my own history and my story has its own power. And 
its own capacity to also affect others the same way that their stories affect me. So there's a shift in my practice that is happening now. And it also has to do with this alternative to assimilation, which I think it's a strategy that most immigrants use. And my understanding is that is that involves erasing part of your own identity or ignoring it or putting it aside to be able to make space to adapt to this culture where you're at better. And I think there has to be a balance between those two. I want to talk about where I come from. I want to be okay with recognizing that I am from Argentina and everything that I bring. I do think that the places where we meet, the places where that difference meets are places that are expansive, that they should not be restrictive. So the more you learn about me and the more I learn about you, the richer an experience we can create together. I wonder, as you encounter the stories of other people here in Cincinnati and share yourself with people here in Cincinnati, how does that shift your own remembering and your own memory as it relates to your personal identity? I think being with others and humans are so are so interesting. I use the word interesting a lot because sometimes I lack another definition, but listening to other people's stories without trying to put my own story on top of it, but just listening, I can acknowledge that there are so many meeting points that sometimes I feel like when I'm listening to someone, I can almost see how their story and my story at some point are threaded together in a very intangible way. And listening to people's stories and doing my best to understand where they come from and acknowledging also the things that we don't have in common, both those little threads that I see that are weaved together and those threads that are going somewhere else helps me be being more intentional with the way that I remember and make. So I talk about this in my practice, this idea of making while remembering or making as a strategy for remembering because my work is so process-based and it's so tied into my family history which involves migration. Almost all my grandparents were immigrants as well. It involves labor. All my grandparents and my father, they are people who work with their hands and involves craft. That's more the, the females say in my family that making creates a conversation with memory. So when I talk with other people or when I listen to other people's stories, I can see how they have some of that in common, maybe it's generational, I don't know, and how it helps me focus my intention more and even like expanding my idea of that remembering looks like in my work. Thanks for listening. Check the show notes for more information about Julia, her new book, Habitats, and all of her work. You can also find the link for our next Abundant Community Conversation with Parker Palmer, Peter Block, and Sushama Austin Connor on October 26th. This episode has been produced by me, Joey Taylor, and the music is from Jeff Gorman.